Welcome everyone to Go Short Online. Tonight we will have three Q&As with three directors that have their film represented in our student competition. Uh, we're going to talk with Mila Zlubchenko, director of Opera Glasses, Daniel Asari Fazi, director of Where We Used to Swim, and Rafael Manuel Mendoza, director of Filipiniana. Um, I'd like to welcome them now into the conversation. Welcome. Hello. Um, before we uh, start, I'd like to point out that the audience can ask questions uh, into the YouTube chat. Uh, I will read them and uh, pass them on to the filmmakers. Um, first, I'd like to start with uh, Mila, the director of Opera Glasses. Uh, before we start, um, we can watch a little clip of Opera Glasses. Света отопления нет в театре. Если бы ты знала, какой холод на улице теплее. Если бы не мой платок, все. А я не знаю, ни воды нет, ни отопления. Да нет, что бы случилось. А миллиард людей и накладки, и все, что хочешь на свете, и программки, и ключи, и, и это, и народ, и все же, и все. Опоздавшие и портер, все идут наверх. Все оценки 850, портер свой, а я и, и рыбу веса нашу и мама. И если я хожу по центру и так далее, и так далее, и так далее, и так далее, сто слов у меня вот то. Вот так и все хорошо. А холодно, тонечко. Yeah, welcome. Um, first of all, uh, congrats with your international premiere. And very nice that we could screen it at Go Show Online, although it's probably not the international premiere you had in mind when making the film. Um, I want to ask you a few questions about the film. Um, I want to start with um, the film um, as two or a few protagonists who are mostly the cloakroom ladies. I was wondering if these cloakroom ladies were already in the beginning uh, when you start developing the film, uh, the protagonist you had in mind, or it somehow developed like this while shooting the film? Uh, thank you for introducing and uh, thanks for uh, making this Q&A. Um, so the cloakroom ladies came in um, fairly early into the concept. We uh, wanted to do this, uh, this film. We planned it all the time with the with the DOP of the project, um, Rebecca, and we talked a lot about uh, possible scenes and what we are interested in, in this place. And we were thinking about the cloakroom ladies as, a, as an element which will be a hold like the whole structure of the film. So you can see a lot of different people and we, we knew that we wouldn't be able to, to have, for example, visitors who will be uh, who will appear several times and be like the heroes of the film. So the mm -hmm. room attendants and the workers of the opera house in Kiev, they were um, giving us the structure. The problem was that when we arrived for the shoot, it was very, very difficult to um, to get them to, to be a part of the film because um, we got the permission from the opera house to shoot the film, but the cloakroom ladies didn't know that we were shooting. So we came in and started shooting and then they were get got really, really silent and like passive aggressive and we didn't know what was no. happening. <laughs> and then uh, we um, we got the information that they were had no idea that there was a film team that was going to shoot a film. So the directors of the um, opera house, they didn't communicate this to them. And it was a really bad start and I was feeling very, very bad because I can understand that it's very, very stressful. 
if um, someone comes to your workplace and starts observing you and you're mm -hmm. very confused about that. So then we decided that we will um, give them some time and stop filming them for a few days. And I was afraid that we will have to change the film and, and start, like maybe we will not be allowed to film that that much all. Um, but then they kind of feel that we are not, uh, we didn't want um, to do any harm to them. Mm -hmm. And little by little, they um, started trusting us. They saw us every day. We, we tried to, to talk to them and to, to say sorry. So then the contact kind of uh, started to, we started to build like a contact. So in the end they were, um, they didn't say anything, but they, um, when we filmed very, very carefully, they said like, oh, come on guys, like, like you can film us, it's okay. Like we, now we're not angry anymore. And um, so it was very, um, they saved us kind of because they start, but they really trusted us and they were very nice to us. And then the end, um, we also celebrated the International Women's Day together. So it was a really nice very end nice. of our <laughs> connection um, at the shoot. Yeah. So how did uh, the shooting look? Like how, how many people did you uh, do it and how many days? Uh, we had only 10 days because also the Opera House was not very happy um, that we would shoot. I think for them it was a whole new experience to let the documentary team uh, take have an insight in how it works. They are very they know that uh, there's a lot of interest in actors and in singers and in dancers, mm -hmm. but it was really weird for them that we wanted to film everything but except for the actors and the singers and the dancers. So they <coughs> were very, very um, um, afraid that we would do something that they won't like. So they gave us 10 days for filming. Uh, that means 10 evenings, 10 different pieces. Um, and uh, we had a crew that was, we were five people. I was there with the German DOP. Um, and we had the Ukrainian sound uh, recordists and two Ukrainian producers who were helping us to arrange everything. And also they were scouting um, uh, protagonists through the opera. So they were kind of spying a little bit for us so that we know where to go next and what to film next. And it was quite a small team. And every day we had uh, like, eight hours with with my DOP to watch the footage from the evening before and to get get crazy about what we are still missing. Um, how and many then hours we, did you shoot in total? Sorry? How many hours did you shoot in total? Uh, I think maybe... Um, 15. Yeah, it was like 10 evenings, two hours. I would say maybe 20 maximum, okay. max, uh, like 20 hours max. But I think it was less. Mm -hmm. Um, Daniel produced the <coughs> film, by the way, <laughs> uh, from Germany. Um, yeah, so we had like, uh, and then in the evening you have very, very concentrated shoot, uh, concentrated shooting time because most of the time the people are inside the auditorium. Um, and in the first days we weren't allowed or we couldn't film the workers of the opera because we had this problem, what I described before. So it was very exciting. We had like this half hour we have to we had to get everything <laughs> it was really mm -hmm. intense intense shoot um phil made me also curious about uh, the role of the opera house in the city uh can you tell me something about this uh yes this opera house um is has been built in the middle of the 19th century and i think um it was the time when opera started to um to get more <coughs> national pieces in each country when uh, people started to write opera pieces in the languages of their countries. Um, so um, Ukraine, the, uh, in Ukraine, uh, we got the opera house pretty late, I would say, uh, but um, it was very important for, for um, the city of Kiev to have this cultural um, point. And then it was, of course, changed during the Soviet period and got and um, 
how it looks now is the the look that uh, the Soviet period kind of gave the opera house. So I think the, fa the facade and a lot of pieces are still original, but uh, a lot of things were reconstructed and changed um, for now. And I would say, um, so um, the opera house is um, in the middle of the city, of course, and it's, um, it's an important meeting point for a certain um, a social uh, kind of social range of people, very different mm -hmm. people from different social uh, slices, kind of. It's a meeting point, melting point for every, um, almost every profession, like the, the medical, like the nurse goes there with her kids and the businessmen go there with their wives and the, um, the people who are not working anymore, um, who are in pension are going mm -hmm. there to meet their friends. It's a very, very diverse yeah. place kind of. So I yeah. think- so the, Not at all a rich, uh, richer class uh, thing. Richard, not no, at all a no, richer class thing. No, no, because yeah, I think it it is a kind of the influence that um, the Soviet politics had um, on the people. So um, everyone has a feeling that culture is important and that you have to show your kids uh, something cultural, even if you are not. Uh, in the bourgeois kind of class. So I think this is a, also a big difference that I noticed. Um, like being in such places, for example, in Germany, that he, here you have a much bigger separation like of the kinds of people mm -hmm. who are in the opera. And in Ukraine, you have the feeling there are very, very different people from different classes. And also the range of the prices of the tickets allows kind of for you to go in the third, um, uh, in the highest uh, seat range, and uh, but to pay just a little money and to enjoy the piece. Yeah. Yeah. So the people who actually need the opera glasses. They, uh, <laughs> they yeah, are very people. needed. Yes. <laughs> very much needed, yeah. Because it also seems like some sort of a ritual uh, they are doing in a way. Um, does, does, do you think this, this ritual has a certain uh, meaning for them going there? With the opera glasses, with uh, no, no, just going, uh, going to the opera. Yes, and all, uh, dressing up, and it seems to be much about appearance in a way. It it is totally. It has a total um, ritually spirit because when I was a kid, I also grew up in Kiev, and I know this opera from my childhood. So I also know this um, exciting evenings when you go with your family to the opera. It was always winter. Uh, always very cold and I wanted to show that in the film also that you you have to kind of completely change your clothes and to change your yeah. mood and your state of, of your spirits kind of so it's a um, it's a big thing for people um, how you dress and how you present yourself and I think the people enjoy it it's like a little um, a little celebration in the middle of of the gray winter days in the country yeah <laughs> That was why I was also wondering if the, the audience uh, liked to be filmed because they were so focused on their appearance. Did you have any trouble with this or was everyone enjoying it? I think some people weren't enjoying it. They were uh, hiding a little bit, but most of the people um, are really opened up. And I think some people even wanted it um, to happen and tried kind of to, um, to be in the frame even. Um, but I think in general they enjoyed the um, that someone is interested in them and that someone wants to wants to see them and wants to show them. Um, yeah, and I hear it a lot from like for example from here in Germany from my friends who are watching this film. They're really always uh, impressed by how naturally the people get themselves uh, pretty and done, and uh, they are they don't have this kind of feel of shame that we experience when we, I don't know, comb our hair in, um, uh, in public, for example. Mm -hmm. There is a, like some kind of feeling that you're not supposed to do that. I don't know, that you're supposed to do that maybe in the bathroom or somewhere mm -hmm. where no one sees it. But in, uh, in Kiev, I had the feeling that people were totally 
um, totally okay with that. And I even saw like a woman, she came like in a, in a ski suit, you know, like whole body suit uh, because it was so cold, but it was totally okay. She like uh, undressed her like huge boots and her ski suit. And then she, she started like to prepare herself and it was a totally normal opened up um, transformation of hers. And yeah, it was really impressing. Is the Opera House in that sense um, representing Ukrainian society in a way, or is it uh, the opposite? Is it more a special place where different classes meet and people behave differently? I would say it may, maybe maybe both. It's very special, and people are in an exceptional mood when going there. It's um, it's very um, the mood is very like the spirits are high up kind of, yeah. but I think, and it was always also the, the interest in that place that you can, you can have an overview of, of what people are like and what behavior is there. And it gives you maybe not, not a clear sense of the whole society, but it gives you like a, um, a little, I don't know, impression of, of uh, what Ukrainian society kind of, consists of and looks like so i think it's it is maybe it's like a sketch it's not very clear but i think i hope that it um yeah you can see it through the screen the different yeah differences um i have one more question but i didn't see any questions coming uh from the audience if someone has a question later you can still type it and i will ask it uh, at another point um i was uh, this is your second film that we selected in our student competition, but if I understood well, still not your graduation film. Um, are you already working on your graduation film? Uh, I am searching for a topic still. Uh, so I would say I'm working on, on getting um, a, yeah, yeah, more um, <clears throat> a straight direction on the graduation film. I have like many ideas that are very, very different. So um, right now it's about collecting them and sorting them out and maybe getting yeah to the to the topic but i'm i'm still not uh, not sure what it will be it's probably a hard time to research also at the moment yes it is it is all um it's different difficult to decide because you cannot you cannot see and feel the things um and you cannot go on the research so it's it's all theoretical thinking right now but yeah, maybe it will, um, yeah, maybe we can turn it into something good. And um, yeah, we try to read uh, a lot um, and help oneself by that, by, by maybe going on through texts and yeah, building somehow uh, a pre-research yeah. at home. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Mila. Uh, we will thank move you. on to Daniel. Uh, who is in the same frame, um, and like you mentioned, also the producer of Opera Glasses, but also a director of Where We Used to Swim. Um, we're going to talk a bit about this film, but first we'll watch a clip of Where We Used to Swim. So Daniel, also for you, congratulations on your international premiere. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start with asking you a little bit uh, about the history uh, of the lake. Can you tell us a bit about this? 
so basically, the lake is in the northern part of Iran in a province called Azerbaijan. But it's not the country Azerbaijan, but it's a big part of the country of Iran. And it used to be the biggest lake of the Middle East. Uh, and it's a very old, ancient lake, uh, which recently almost dried out just to, I think, 5% of its original size. Uh, nowadays, just covered in salt. It's more like a salt desert than a lake. Yeah. Is it, uh, are you from that area? Um, so basically, my father is from Tabriz, which is the capital of the Azerbaijan province. Mm -hmm. But uh, he moved to Germany and I was born and raised here and I grew up here, but I travel a lot to the country and I have shot several uh, films there. So I try to keep the connection. Yeah, because I was wondering, you also have some found footage um, in the film. Is it is it from someone you personally know or did you get it from an archive <coughs> or how did this came uh, in the film? Um, I got it from a singer who is from there. I don't know her personally, but uh, I saw a YouTube video of her song and there was this piece of found footage. So it's just that one shot that we used uh, yeah, like yes. a phantom ride over the lake uh, when it used to have still water. So we, we yeah, just took that only bit, but I, d I personally don't have any found footage from there. Uh, but uh, whenever we did vacation in Iran and met our family, we always went to the lake and we went swimming there. So I remember the lake still having some water, not a lot, but uh, enough to just have a quick bath. Yeah. Yeah, because I could somehow sense some nostalgia also in the film and next to, I would say, sadness. Um, because in the end, you chose to make it a very uh, clear political film as well. Um, why did you choose for this? Uh, I think those are two uh, interesting topics. So on, on the one hand, the nostalgia and uh, the political statement, because uh, I didn't really want to make an explicitly political film with that. For me, it's more like a metaphor, the, the whole lake and the desert is uh, like a political ma metaphor that it's not only about, okay, what went wrong? Why is the lake dried out? But okay, we have this dried out lake and nowadays people are treating it like that. Mm -hmm. uh, should have more like a social political context than just blaming uh, politicians, for example, not to act or anything. I didn't want to make a, let's say political attack on anyone, but uh, for sure, I think in this, uh, way how people treat it nowadays it's a it's a political act to show it that way but also do you in the end um, address the politicians also sorry don't you in the end of the film also address the politicians that they didn't uh, act? no it, it says in the end that it became a political uh political issue the whole uh, whole lake because the thing is that a lot of different political parties are taking the lake, the symbol of the lake, to use it for their own uh, narratives. And um, for me, I think it was more interesting to see the nostalgia and the melancholy of the people who are affected by this, who are, uh, have strong relations to the lake because it's like a cultural symbol for the whole Azerbaijan and Kurdish area in Iran, but still they treat it the way they treat it. So there was a, a ambivalence in this act of how people are there and taking a piss next to the lake, throwing the trash uh, over there. But it's not, in my opinion, it's not nor a film about uh, political action in a way of party politics, uh, uh, nor is it a film about um, uh, climate change, for example, because also a lot of people see this climate change aspect in it, but mm -hmm. it's uh, recently man-made problem. I mean, climate change is also man-made, but this is something that uh, occurred just in the last 10 years, 10 to 15 years. Yeah, but what is the cause of this drought? Uh, there are several reasons. Uh, one is that uh, also the farmers in the locations around the lake, they use the uh, ground level water uh, for their plantations, uh, but they didn't use it in the right way. So. Uh, it slowly started, the groundwater uh, started to vanish and the whole ground is now dried out. So that's why 
no, for example, new rain can go into the groundwater, but it just stays on the surface. Yeah. Uh, and it's all salty, the surface, which makes it very hard for the water to go to groundwater. And um, the other reason is the bridge, which I'm also showing in the film, because uh, they just uh, constructed a bridge through the whole uh, lake. So it stopped the natural streams of the, of the lake. And um, that's why, for example, the southern part, uh, just south of the bridge, uh, after the bridge was complete, it started to dry out within a couple of years. Um, yeah, so, and there are a lot of dams as well. So uh, in the film, the film starts with this uh, wide shot of a dam and they have around 50 dams of the incoming uh, rivers and they stop the natural rivers to reach the, the lake. And uh, yeah, there are several reasons, but uh, yeah, just to point that out. It sounds like something that can also, like the dams, can it be easily solved? The problem is the dams, they have two um, reasons where there, one is that you can get electricity out of it, but also that uh, you have the sweet water, not the salty water, mm -hmm. um, to use it for agriculture, for example. Oh, yes. So that's why they use it. So <clears throat> it's right, you can construct dams the way that they still have enough water flow through to uh, get the lake alive. But I think it's also the amount, the amount uh, of dams, because it's like all, over 50 dams that they built. That's a lot. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if there's also people using it in a new way that is kind of positive, because you told, just said uh, people uh, dump their shit there. And, um, but is there also like an, an use in a new way that is actually nice? Um, nice, I mean, in a way that people can make business out of it, um, that there are a lot of uh, companies these days who are harvesting the salt. I don't know if you call it harvesting, but they go out with the trucks in the middle of the lake and get the salt and sell it. So they use that salt. And I think it's only also one of the only possibilities to keep it alive is to get away the salt so the water can uh, start uh, flowing to the ground again. Um, but other than that, it's not uh, really a positive aspect. I think, yeah, people are still passing by and yeah, they, they make a picnic on the bridge, but it's not like it used to be in the past when it was a big uh, yeah, magnet for tourism in the area as well. Yeah. Um, the film has an uh, important role for uh, music and poetry. Um, can you tell me something about the choice you made in the music and the, and the poem you took? Um, so they are both um, modern. It's not that they're ancient, but the, the poem is a reference to a very ancient um, uh, poet of the Azerbaijan culture. Uh, and there was this uh, guy, I think he was an activist, and he took that, natu uh, that uh, ancient poet uh, which is um, a poem about a mountain in the Azerbaijan area. And he's talking to the mountain kind of, it's a dialogue between this man and the mountain. Uh, so this activist took that poem and he replaced uh, the words and the structure of the mountain with the lake. So it became a kind of political symbol as well. A lot of people got active uh, within recent yeah, 10 years, 15 years. And um, the song is really pop cultural. It's a pop cultural song about the lake and it's kind of uh, Happy by Pharrell Williams. It kind of got a viral hit. So people took that song and they were dancing on the streets. And that was exactly the thing that I talked about earlier that <clears throat> people are sad and so sorry and melancholic about the loss of the lake, but still they can dance. and. <laughs> Um, they also use this kind of uh, ambivalence in this song. Yeah, so the, the, as well, the song as the poem are directly uh, focused on this specific lake. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Very nice. Um, okay, um, I think we're gonna move on to Raphael now. Um, again, if people still have questions, uh, ask them and I will ask them later.
Um, get my right notes, Rafael. Um, now we're going to first watch a, a short clip of uh, Filipiniana. Nandito ba si Charlie? Sorry po, hindi ko po kilala si Charlie. Hindi mo kilala si Charlie? Eh lahat dito kilala si Charlie ah. Bago lang po kasi ako dito eh, kakasimula ko lang po nung karang linggo. Ha? Ah, hindi alata eh ha. Para kang sanay na sanay na eh. Salamat po. So, hey, Rafael, um, also for you, uh, great that we can screen your film uh, in our online uh, environment. I think it's your first screening after your premiere in Berlinale. Yes, it is. Thank yeah. you for having it here. Really think, uh, excited to be part of Go Shards. I think all three of you only had one physical screening and <laughs> then Go Short. <laughs> um, let's talk a bit about uh, Filipiniana. Um, in your film, we observe something that looks like uh, modern slavery. Um, and you uh, also record an uh, introduction uh, for our online festival where you call it uh, structural violence. Mm -hmm. um, why did you decide to address this topic? Um, yeah, I think that, um, especially with cinema that comes out of Southeast Asia, um, that a lot of it focuses on uh, very like obvious acts of violence, such as like murder and rape. And when you hear of like things coming and news items coming out of the Philippines, you hear about um, Duterte's drug war and about 30,000 people have, have been killed uh, extrajudicially. But then also more important than that, to me at least, is the fact that while this all is happening, people are still playing golf, you know, like the malls are still open and like, you know, the economy goes. And for me, that's, that's kind of like, um, it points to a much more um, inherent violence that's um, inherent to the society of the Philippines and maybe not just the Philippines, but that this is the structural violence that I try to touch on in Filipinian. Um, because it looks like they're all part of one machine in this film that they're just uh, following. And um, the images are very beautiful, but still the film is somehow very bleak because I'm trying to try to find something positive in this film. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, did, is there some light in this film that you try to give some hope, or is your uh, depiction of uh, Philippine society also very bleak? Um, I think it depends on what part of Philippine society you come from. I think if you come from the upper class or like the upper middle class in the Philippines, and life is good in the Philippines, you know, it's like um, um, the standard of living is. It's not too bad, and uh, and and uh, um, and the cost of life is cheap, and people don't earn. Uh, you know, they 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 earn pretty decently, con comparable to the to the um, the stand the the cost of living. But then I guess if you come from maybe the lower classes, and uh, for example, like um, usually the kind of backgrounds that the tea girls come from, then uh, you know there's like there's no verticality in terms of like their, their projections in life. Like when I was interviewing a lot of the tea girls uh, that were working in the, in the driving ranges in the golf course, I'd ask them about like what they think about the whole day because the whole day they're just there sitting on stools, serving golf balls for golfers to hit. And you know, it's like the, the lack of verticality in their, in their lives kind of seeps into them. And they, they tell me that they don't really think about much, like ask them what their dreams are and what their ambitions are. And they, they they don't they don't really have any, and so I think that's the kind of structural violence that I'm talking about, one that seeps in and and kills the fight in you even before you you have a chance, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a very brutal subject in a way, um, but you mm. chose to picture it with very beautiful, even soothing images in a way. 
Mm -hmm. How did this this combination came about? Um, I think like the aesthetic of the golf course with its lush greeneries and uh, I mean and like the the imported Bermuda gra grass like quite lends itself to it. I think that the the contrast of the subject matter and uh, the way that we chose to 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 cover it kind of points to the artificiality of of these golf courses and instead of trying to um, to depict truth or like to strip artifice of artifice like I, I wanted to point out the artifice of this kind of social structures to in hopes of pointing out the violence of them um i think that like one personal anecdote I can share is that when the team and I were shooting in the Philippines, we were in the Philippines for about two months shooting this film, and uh, we were going through uh, probably one of the worst droughts uh, that Manila's ever seen. But uh, these golf courses, every day we'd be on them. We're watering the grasses like, like as if there's no as if there's no water shortage. So I think oh, that's yeah, yeah that's, that speaks volumes. <laughs> um. Can you tell me about uh, something about uh, the song you chose in the um, karaoke scene in the end? Ah, yes. Um, so the song is, um, it's a Filipino, it's a Tagalog folk song that revolves around, I guess it's, it's a very common one that revolves around the, the day in the life of a fisherman who spends the mm -hmm. whole day fishing just so he can catch one single fish which he sells in the market just so he can earn enough money to buy some, some rum. And for me, I saw parallels between that and kind of like the cyclical, non-vertical life that these tea girls live. And so for me to have Isabel sing that song towards the end um, acted as my sort of climax for the film, seeing as not much happens in the film. It was more of an emotional climax than anything else. And I know I needed, like, for me, like, even beyond the cinema and beyond other forms of art, music has the advantage of being super guttural. In terms of like when you play music and when you hear music, it, you you feel it. You completely feel it. And uh, and and for me, um, the song, given a certain context, would be able to do that. And I hope it does that. Yeah. yeah. Although she uh, she got asked to show her soul more in this song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I guess she does a little, but she still seems very hopeless uh, in a way. Um, mm -hmm. I also was wondering. Uh, you have a very um, the smoking also seems to play a big role. Mm -hmm. um, is this uh, so has this to do with the self-destruction of it? I, I think yeah. I think that's that's one aspect to it. I think um, I mean, and if you want to talk more, uh, I guess practically as well, that um, the tobacco, like that, a lot of politicians in the Philippines own tobacco farms, and you know, like that because of that, sin tax in the Philippines and tobacco and tax in the Philippines is very low, and so. Mm -hmm tobacco to smoke in the Philippines is really cheap. Like uh, people buy s stick cigarettes on the on the street and they smoke. And you know, this it also kind of goes to show all the smoking in the film is just goes to show that they really have nothing else to do but to smoke. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in your introduction, you also tell that you're working on three new projects at the moment. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so I'm working on uh, two shorts. Uh, one that I want to shoot in uh, in London, and then one that I want to shoot back home in the Philippines, back in that kind of community that I showed in Filipinian as well, except mm -hmm. not focusing so much on the golf course, but on like the surrounding um, gated subdivisions. Because a lot of these golf courses are encased in like gated subdivisions where the bourgeois live, and those are worlds within themselves. Um, and also, I'm uh, we're in development for the full-length version of Filipinian as well. Nice. Yeah. So let's see. Um, mm -hmm. One more question uh, uh, to wrap it up. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering um, when you make a film, you always have a, a, first a concept, uh, then uh, the product, and then um, uh, in the end, you uh, can see it um, when it's finished on the screen. Uh, how much changed in between when you started with the first concept and how the film? Radically, because the first concept was um, was a feature, it was a full length. Yeah. So um, what we did is because we didn't get the the funding that we needed for the full length, we um, we decided to sh short like a, a shoot a much shorter excerpt. But I was very adamant that the the short within itself was a film in its own right. Mm -hmm. So whereas the feature focused more on not just the golf course but like the country club culture around it, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, um, because country clubs are very common in the Philippines, I wanted to kind of give people a taste and an intro first onto the golf course, which I think would lead itself naturally to the surrounding social structures around the golf course. Yeah, and so now the the feature you're working on, it's still the same idea as you had in in the first place. Yes, 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 it's still ah. the same idea. Um, yeah, so it's it 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 expands it from the golf course to the surrounding. Uh, like um country club uh, milieu yeah. like where, where they have swimming pools ballroom dancing you know polo fields like all within the philippines right so it's, it's kind of absurd <laughs> all right um yeah. since there are no questions um, um uh, i will wrap it up i would like to thank you all very much uh, for this conversation it's very nice to still hear something more about the films so very happy we could still do this um we will put this, these interviews also in our online environment so people can watch it uh, before or after the films. Um, for everyone watching, you can still watch the films for another week um, in our hub. Um, um, both, uh, all three of the films are in the student competition, um, which is overall very great. So please give it a watch. Um, well, thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Marcia.